Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making headlines with the columnist Karen Malone and editor of The Courier, David Clegg. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's take a look at what is on those front pages. We'll start with the eye, boosting election hopes for the Tories. The PM is level with Keir Starmer as preferred leader of the country, that paper reports. The Telegraph leads on plans being drawn up by Mr Sunak to expand the windfall tax on energy firms in an effort to fill the UK's fiscal black hole. The Guardian has a different take, highlighting the bumper profits recorded by Shell on the day that the UN finds there is no credible way to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees. As the global economy slows and cost pressures mount, the FT reports that more than $550 billion has been slashed from the value of US tech companies. Royals in despair, that's the Metro's top story. It's focusing on concern among the royal family about the contents of Prince Harry's coming memoir. It's the same story on the front page of the Daily Mail. Well, The Sun reports that uh, Prince William will not travel to Qatar to watch England play in the World Cup next month. The front of the mirror shows a picture of the convicted sex, uh, child sex trafficker Ghislaine Maxwell going on a run in the grounds of the jail where she uh, is facing 20 years. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you see on your screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch along with us. Well, I'm pleased to say we're joined tonight by the columnist Carol Malone and the editor of The Courier, David Clegg. And there they are. Carol, David, good evening to you. Thank you for being with us. Lovely to have you both here. Well, let's dive straight in, straight in then, shall we, uh, Carol? We'll start with um, The Eye, which picks up on uh, a poll that shows that uh, Sunak coming in as leader of the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister has given the Conservative Party some kind of election hope. It's a, it's a good story. It's, 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 it does give the Tories hope because what it's basically saying is that um, people believe that he will be better with the economy and with taxes than Sir Keir Starmer would, and of course that is true. You know, we know him to be an expert on on financial matters. Um, the, the poll, however, does say that um, that uh, he levels with Starmer as the preferred leader, um, which is pretty good considering he's only been in power for a handful of days. But, but it, what it does say is the bad news for Mr... Um, I'm very aware that the light is shining on my glasses. Oh, you're doing fine. Don't worry, Carol. And, it's all right. Do you know what it is? I can see the spotlight re reflect the <laughs> mouse. Anyway, but the bad news is if an election was called tomorrow, um, the, to the Labour would win by a landslide, which is not good news. But we kind of know that. And, and, you know, we can't... Well, you know, we, we take our guidance from polls. We know that they're not the case. If Rishi does well in the next six months, uh, six months to a year, well, then, they, you know, he's got a very good hope of, of the Tories winning the next election. That is, of course, if he can keep his party to control and stop them cannibalising of each other. But it's it's quite a good poll, considering that he's only been in power for a few days. What it does do, this poll, of course, it's a big blow for um, a comeback for Boris in 2024. It is saying that that's, people just don't want that to happen. But, um, you know, who knows? You know, with, <laughs> with Boris, you, ne you never know. But it but it is good. And, and, and you know, Hunt and Sunak are currently looking... Um, at, at you know at, at, at ways to, to fix the economy there and, and although although um, Mr Hunt is the Chancellor, I'm not entirely sure he'll be having much to do with the upcoming budget in November. I think he's um, I think Rishi would be Chancellor by proxy because his plan will already be in place now. He knows what he's got to do um, and he's already hinted as to what he's going to do. So yeah, let's wait and see. Yeah, and David, it, I, I suppose it's difficult for the Labour Party, isn't it? Because for the past sort of uh, six months or so, they've been really pushing this idea that they are the ones who are fiscally uh, responsible. Uh, and that was sort of evidenced by what we saw the disastrous mini budget. But quick change of leader, and it's all changed around in the public's opinion, apparently. I, th I think given the chaos of the last few weeks, if the poll ratings hadn't improved with this change of prime minister, it would have been a major surprise. Given the uh, 
what must be go down in history is the most disastrous budget uh, in the history of the UK, the impact it had on the markets, but also uh, talking of the poll, the impact it had on Conservative poll ratings. So I think given that Rishi Sunak had been Chancellor before, it is something that people associate himself with. I think this will be a harder uh, a harder target now for the Labour Party to reinstate themselves as the party of fiscal responsibility, because that, of course, is not something that has necessarily traditionally been associated with Labour. I think that is going to be more of a challenge for them now. There is, of course, the issue that R Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister and indeed Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor are facing what is the most foreboding uh, financial picture for many years, certainly since the, the crash. So, they are going to have a very difficult time, and they're the ones who are in power. They're the ones who are going to have to make these decisions, these decisions, many of which are going to be painful, that are going to be unpopular. So whether the uh, financial prudence and the trust in Rishi Sunak to steer the economy remains that way as we get through uh, what's going to be a very difficult winter and through 2023, that remains to be seen. Yeah, and I'll say with you, uh, uh, David, to go to the Daily Telegraph, because exactly on that, these decisions that have to be made, the Telegraph reporting, and this will be a manner to the Labour Party, that he's planning to perhaps expand that windfall tax, which is exactly what Labour have been calling for for the past few months. Yes, indeed. Uh, and that would be, I, I, I think that would probably be a popular uh, policy. I think it is a it is a very distinct change in tack from uh, the Liz Truss regime. Uh, the, this, the idea would be not only that they extend it past the cutoff of December 2025, but also perhaps I think it's set at 25% at the minute to increase the rate of the levy so they would be generating even more money uh, from these big energy companies. I think given the record profits announced again by Shell today, uh, that that is something that I think will probably prove uh, popular, that would maybe uh, win support across the political divide at this point. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that is something we see the uh, Conservative Party and Rishi Sunak uh, considering uh, as they face these numbers and have to plug this massive spending gap. So I, I think there's probably an easy win there because it's not something Labour can criticise them for. It's something that will prove popular with the, with the public. Uh, and it, it shows also that they're they're uh, trying to generate money as well as just uh, to, to moving on to spending cuts, which I guess is the concern from people uh, very worried about how they're going to pay their their bills this winter. Yeah, right. I, I, as David's right, Carol, isn't he? That the idea of that kind of tax on those big profits is quite popular, and uh, Liz Truss was ideologically against it. But what does this tell us about the way Rishi Sunak is willing to sort of move with the times and and try and plug that gap that there is in the finances? I think it's a really sensible thing to do. You know, it's a 40 billion um, black hole, but that could be so easily filled if he takes a big chunk from all the big energy companies. You know, all he has to say to them is, you know, these are tough times. You guys have been making sky high profits for X amount of years. There has been no cap on those profits. So for this year, this year alone, maybe even for next year, depending on what the climate is like, this is we're going to take a percentage of your profits. And, you know, what can those energy companies do? They know that they make the profits they've made have been obscene. There has to be some give of them. And I reckon he could fill that 40 billion hole fairly quickly with some money of the, of the oil companies. And then maybe he doesn't have to, to hit the people of the country quite so hard. Because while this poll we've just seen today says that, you know, people, you know, they like the way he handles the economy, the bottom line is, with Liz Truss's budget, people are going to get a cut in their income tax. This way, they're going to get a big rise in their income tax, with the, still with national insurance, with, ordinary, with, you know, ordinary income tax. They're going to take a hit. And where people, you know, it's, it's, it's a very tough thing for people. They know it's the sensible thing to do to have a tax rise when times are hard. But, you know, we are in the midst of the biggest cost of living crisis ever. You know, we've seen people today, I think it's on one of the papers, it could be The Guardian today, people have been rushing today to, to register their, their meter reading so that they get because this is the day, midnight tonight, this is when all the, the prices go up, when it becomes something like, I don't know, 1,900 quid a year uh, for, for energy. That's the average price for energy. Well, that goes up. It, that goes to that at midnight tonight. So people have been hanging on until the last minute to register their meter readings to get as long as they can on the cheapest possible rate. This shows how desperate people are to save every penny. So when he does put taxes up, as he is going to, in November, that's when his popularity may take a dive again. So yes, as much as he can take from these oil companies is a good thing.
Uh, let's move on to the next story before we go to break, guys. And Carol, I'll stay with you for this one. This is on the front page of The Guardian. And this is uh, one of the issues, uh, one of the sort of landmines that Rishi Sunak may have laid for himself by bringing Suella Braverman back in to government six days after she was sacked, resigned over a security breach. Yes, yeah, and, and, and Labour are kicking up. It's not just about it's not just about what happened last week, where, where she was supposed to have sent a, a, a private document. She broke ministerial code. But this is also about a leak. It involves a leak uh, when she was Attorney General um, involving MI5. And Labour are stirring this up, and, and I know why they're doing it because. And, and I suspect the civil service are doing it too. They don't want Suella Braverman. The, the blob, if you like, have their own agenda. They know what Suella Braverman is going to do on issues like immigration. She has vowed to cut the, the channel crossings and she's she's going to do it in quite a, a tough way. So I think there are many people who don't want Suella Braverman in, in situ. But also there's a, there's a view around today that keeping her in that job placates the right of the party. It keeps them happy. And that's what Sunak is trying to do now. That All that talk last week of him employing a cabinet of the big talent. Well, it wasn't necessarily a cabinet of the big talent. It was, it was a coalition of the warring factions. And he was appeasing them, giving them jobs to shut them up so he can unite the party again. And Suella Braverman is very, very popular with the right because of the stuff she has said. Um, I think she has to temper her language a bit. I, I saw a, an interview that she did a couple of months ago where she was talking about her big dream is to see um, a plane load of migrants go to Rwanda. Now, you know, while we know that that, that she, wants to, she wants to implement that system, to talk about it being her dream is a little bit silly, and I can see why that would upset some people. But, you know, I think she's tough. I think the civil service don't want her there, and Labour certainly don't want her there. OK, uh, Carol, uh, David, thank you for that. David, not got time to come to you. We'll go to break, but I'll start off with you next when we come back after these advertisements. Carol, David, wait right where you are now. Plenty more from the press view preview to come, including this on the front of the Daily Mail. Their headline, Royals dreading Harry's war and unflinching book. Hello and welcome back. You are watching the Press Preview. I'm pleased to say we're still joined by Carol Malone uh, and the editor of The Courier, David Clegg. Uh, Carol, David, thanks for staying with us through that break. Right, David, let's pick up uh, with you on the front page of The Guardian. I mean, the picture uh, says it all, really, doesn't it? And the headline, No Way Back. This is another terrifying report coming out of the UN uh, on the face, uh, on the extent of the climate crisis. Yes, and I think one of the interesting things about the tone around it now is there is a sense of defeatism about it. And I think that was kind of underlying today. We not only have the the Shell report, uh, the Shell profits, we also have the, um, the fact that uh, Rishi Sunak is not planning to attend COP27. And, I, and one thing I've been struck by in particular is, is the complete change in tone and sentiment about dealing with the climate crisis from a year ago. It was, it was almost exactly a year ago that they were, Glas they were gathering in Glasgow for COP26, and it felt like it was at, at the top of the political agenda, this uh, absolute emergency for the first time in the way it hadn't really uh, been before. Since then, a couple of things have changed. I think uh, the most pressing, probably the, the war in Ukraine and the, and the issue with Russia. So there is this sense that that worry about energy security, uh, the global dynamics behind that has, I think, changed the priorities of, 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 the, of the politicians across, across Europe and the rest of the West, really. And, and that is shown by the, I think that's highlighted vividly by the fact that Rishi Sunak's not even planning to go. We know that uh, King Charles uh, it, it, uh, has said already that he's he's not going. And I just don't think that it would be feasible that that would have been the situation a year ago. Instead, the case is that, uh, that we know this emergency is coming. The UN, uh, that the, the UN report is is absolutely bleak reading. It's saying there's no credible pathway. It talks about uh, preparations for this being woefully inadequate, that there will have to be wide scale, a widespread social change across the world if we try to get to what 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 is actually a fairly um, modest target uh, compared to what needs to be done. But I think 
the, the political will, will towards this uh, has sapped over the last year and there's not much sign of that changing. Yeah, and Carol, a, a, a thought from you on this. We haven't got loads of time left, but obviously... I, mean, you, I, don't, say... really, I don't really agree with that at all. Go I mean, on. I think you know, Sunak has just inherited the, the job. He's got, he's, he's got the biggest job of any peacetime prime minister. You, you name it, the economy, you know, raging inflation, ra raging interest rates, uh, the cost of living crisis, all these things he's got to deal with. And, and, and he's, he has said clearly that this is not about a, a change of priority. He's saying that it's, it's, he's not downgraded climate change as a, as, a, as a priority. He's just saying that he's got a truckload of work to do here at this moment in time, and he can't be there to do that as well. He's got so many things to put in place. He's got to steady the markets. He's got to make them confident again. And we don't have a long time to do that. We've got a matter of weeks. We've taken a massive battering on a, on a world stage in terms of our, our credibility as, a, as, a, as an economy. So he's got some stuff to do, but he has said absolutely clearly that it's it's not a downgrade, and that he's going to keep tabs on what's going on there. And let's not forget, Britain is only responsible for one percent of global emissions. Some of the countries that are going there, um, to, to, I think you know, China, the US, the Indias, they until they get their act together, nothing we do in this country is going to matter. So I think that what he's got on his plate now is is you know I don't think it's a it's a desertion of his duty towards climate change at all. OK, Carol, David, I really appreciate that great discussion. Stay with us because you'll be with us for the next hour as well. And we'll be back with you very, very soon.